Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter High. My guests today are Rick Riaboli and Richard Cox. Rick is the Executive Vice President and Chief Information Officer of Comcast, a Fortune 50 telecommunications giant with revenues exceeding $108 billion annually. As CIO, Rick is responsible for building and managing the technology that supports the end-to-end -end customer experience for both residential customers and business customers. Prior to joining Comcast, he was the Senior Vice President of Product and Technology at RCN. Richard is the Chief Information Officer of Cox Enterprises, a privately held, family-owned, $21 billion conglomerate. As CIO, Richard is responsible for overseeing IT across the enterprise, including strategy and standards, as well as providing guidance to business unit leaders on opportunities around data analytics, business intelligence, infrastructure, security, and more. In 2018, Richard spent time as the Chief Operating Officer for the City of Atlanta as an executive on loan. In this interview, we discuss how both executives are rethinking the employee experience for a new world of work. Rick shares his view on the future of work and why he thinks Comcast will work in a hybrid mode once the pandemic is over, the cultural differences Rick has noticed between product development teams and IT teams, and how he transformed the IT culture at Comcast. We also discuss how Richard defines leadership, why Cox Enterprises is putting cybersecurity at the top of mind for all of its employees, not just those in IT, and a variety of other topics. This episode was recorded live at a recent MetaStrategy Digital Symposium. If you enjoy Technovation, please consider reading my new book, Getting to Nimble, How to Transform Your Company into a Digital Leader. The book is available today on Amazon. As a special offer to our CXO listeners, if you purchase 50 or more copies of the book for your team, I'd be happy to join your team for a discussion on it. To learn more, write us at information at metastrategy.com or visit gettingtonimble.com. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you so much for, for joining me uh, today. It's great to see you both. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for having me. Peter, great to see you. Well, the, the, the pleasure is mine, I assure you. Um, well, Richard, uh, Richard Cox, why don't I begin with you? Uh, as I mentioned, you are the, uh, the CIO of Cox Enterprises. Um, I should also mention you're a, a board-level CIO, a director of, uh, of the Genuine Parts Company. You are also the chief operating officer of the city of Atlanta. Uh, time willing, I'd love to, to talk to you a little bit about some of your experience there and your time both as a, in government in addition to the private sector. But um, I, I wanted to begin with uh, talking about this major digital transformation and acceleration that you have, you've experienced through the pandemic. And um, how has your thinking about employee experience changed during this time in light of the many changes that employees have had to endure in the way in which they work? So give us a few thoughts, if you would. Absolutely. Great question. And let me begin by, by saying that I think leadership is the core competency that really supports the transformation of technology. And, and when I think about leadership, I think about capability, competency, and compassion. And, and those things are fuel really to grow individuals and companies. And, and I started with that because one of the things that we've seen when we work with our, our customers and particularly on our cable side of the business, what we saw was a, a, an extreme increase in demand, which uh, is intuitive. And secondarily, what we saw is a need for, for our clients to get up quickly. And we, we had initiatives focused on self-installs as an example, and those initiatives were accelerated greatly. But what we learned going back to that compassion piece is it was more than getting them up and, and having them run. And, and our, our employees were going through the same thing. So in addition to doing their day job, they were homeschooling, they were balancing the per, their personal lives with their work lives. And, and that need to support them over and beyond our jobs really fueled us to make sure that we kept them front and center in all the decisions. And the last thing I'll say is uh, absolutely the tools that we're using now, Zoom as an example, Microsoft Teams, uh, really double downing on that type of technology to create that connection has been really important. Very interesting. Uh, sticking with you for a moment longer, Richard, I find it so interesting. This applies to both of you in many ways, but uh, you, of course, among the many businesses that you 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 are a part of that are under the umbrella of Cox Enterprises, including includes providing wireless and cable services to people's homes. So many of those homes are now offices of a kind today, and so your B two C customers are in in essence or in a way can be thought of as mini B two Bs in some ways as well. 
And I wonder how has all that you've delivered for your employees informed your decisions about how best to manage customer experience as those customers are going through the very same kind of migration as well? I, I think it's given us more sensitivity. We we see firsthand what, as an example, what our employees are going through and 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 the challenges that they have on a day-to-day basis. And so uh, going back to that leadership comment, look, when you understand and you have empathy what, for, for what people are going through, it creates a, a passion. And that passion for us has created uh, the acceleration of innovation. And so that move to digital, that move to allow uh, individuals to more rapidly, whether, whether it's more rapidly get their cable going or on our Cox Automotive side, more rapidly move to a digital experience with our auctions, it's really driven the acceleration. Mm-hmm. Rick Riaboli, um, the CIO of Comcast, as I mentioned earlier, I, I want to talk to you a bit further about what you're thinking about in the post-COVID world. Although we are still very much in the throes and grip of this uh, terrible pandemic, uh, the vaccine, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, at least gives us reason for hope that the post-COVID world might come as early as 2021. And therefore, it's very important even now to be thinking about what that might entail. Talk about the way in which you're planning uh, employee experiences as you contemplate the post-COVID world, please. What we're looking at, from my perspective, is very much what we saw in the survey, um, where I think we're going to be, from my team's perspective, probably looking at a, um, a hybrid situation where I think we're going to be looking at the buildings not so much as the things we go back to, but looking at them as what can they do for us, right? And just looking at them as assets or tools for us as we think about the future. From my perspective, I think what we'll be doing a lot of is uh, work, continuing to work from home and doing a lot of our software development from home, but then doing a lot of our collaboration in the buildings that we have, whether they're downtown in the suburbs or wherever they are. Yeah, very interesting. And um, thinking about the employee experience of, of your IT teams, you, you I know you spent the majority of your career in product engineering and then took on your CIO role. And that's really oriented in many ways, the way in which you think about um, your, your responsibilities as a CIO. In many ways, I think from the get-go of your time, I know from our past conversations, having spent time with you, that even from the inception of your time as a chief information officer, you were thinking about really where the CIO role has been going as opposed to where it has been uh, in thinking about customer experience, digital transformation, et cetera, with that product lens in mind. Um, can you share uh, some insights uh, about um, uh, f- about that set of perspectives and how they apply, especially now? Sure. Yeah, it was, it was a really um, fascinating transition for me to go from living in sort of the product and product engineering world over to IT, because from my perspective, the work is extremely similar. You know, we're building, we're building like essentially large scale software systems to both support the customers and in in many cases, our own employees. But what I found was the process around them was, was extremely different. So where the the product development process um, for, for building product was really a a very collaborative, you know, development process where the product owners, product managers, and the engineering teams would get together and kind of envision the product together and solution it together. Where what I found was more on the IT side, the culture was a little bit more of an order taker culture, right? It was a culture where um, the, the business teams had very specific ideas about what they wanted to do. They had very specific projects and they would go and get the budget and they would go put a timeline around it. And then the IT teams were there to implement it. And coming from the former world into this world, it just felt, uh, it was was very surprising to me. And so um, when I stepped back and looked at, well, what's the outcome of these two different processes? And what I found was the outcome on the product side was we ended up with um, what I would say was platforms that gave us reusable capabilities. And those reusable capabilities ended up translating later into speed and agility, right? And what I saw on the IT side was those processes were leading to more, I'd say point solutions, right? Because each of our business partners would ask us to do specific things and we would go build 
you know, specific systems or solutions for those requests. And so what it felt like was what we were building there, these point solutions or siloed solutions ended up becoming um, really slowed us down over time. And so that was really the, the, the big difference I saw between the two cultures. Very interesting. And sticking with you for a moment longer, Rick, um, how has that shifted the way in which your IT teams work in light of all that you've just described? Yeah, so so when I took on the CIO role, CIO role, that was one of the first things I really challenged was what would it take to actually shift the culture? You know, because it's common to come in, come into a new role and change the priorities and change work structures and really do a lot of those things. And I kept those things generally the same, but really went after the culture and really challenged um, some fundamental questions like um, our business partners are really our partners, right? And, and they're not our customers. The folks that pay the bills every month are our customers. And that's really, really what we're, we're building solutions for them, right? And trying to get the teams to think about acting as owners and not renters right? Not transactional. And how do we get folks to collaborate with their peers so we're not building these siloed solutions, but we're building reusable platforms. And so it's been a journey. I mean, it's been three years now, um, but we've really transformed the way we work. And um, I'm pretty excited about the way we did that. It, It also, I should mention, had budget implications because when we did this, it started to impact. We went to the business and said, we would like to take that IT budget and bring it over into the IT organization so that we can manage it on a holistic basis as opposed to reacting to individual requests. And that's that's had a big impact on the way we think about our teams and our resources as well. Yeah, very interesting. Richard, uh, it's during these times when there is so much that is unprecedented that leading from one's gut can actually be a real problem because one's gut is based upon uh, our experiences, uh, you know, what we've seen in the past that looks like the present. Well, there's not a lot that looks like the present in many ways. And so so it's that much more important that we come with data as the saying goes, and God, we trust everyone else, please bring data. Um, can you talk a bit about the role that data plays, uh, data and analytics for that matter, play in managing employee experience from your perspective? Absolutely. So I, I've been in my role for just about a, a year, and I share that only to make the comment. One of the first things that I did was elevate the position of data and analytics. Uh, it had been sub- subordinated uh, under, you know, a couple levels down. And so I uh, was really excited to bring that as a direct report because to, to your point, uh, the, the data can provide insights that can really transform your business. And that, I go back to that concept of leadership. You know, a, a big piece of that is continuous improvement. And so what we've been able to do is we've leveraged the data that we've received from our employees to iterate on the most important things. And as we're in this remote posture, you think about uh, the need for help desk support as an example. So we've leveraged the insights from our call center to be much more proactive so that we understand when customers or employees are struggling with internet issues as an example. And we've been much more proactive than we have been uh, in in the past. And the, the last thing I'll say is, we leverage this data to create insights relative to how we will, to your survey question, work in the future. And that has been uh, really fascinating as we slice and dice the data in different ways. But it has absolutely been in the forefront of how we continue to evolve the customer or employee experience. Prior to this role, uh, and in an interregnum between two experiences at Cox, you were the chief operating officer of the city of Atlanta. You managed through the worst ransomware attack in the city's history. Talk a bit about how that experience, uh, that that time that you spent in government, has um, impacted your thinking as you went back to the private sector. Sure. Well, let me begin by setting context. I always like to share this. This happened on the third day of my (laughs) arrival at City Hall. And so talk about uh, trial by fire. Uh, It was absolutely uh, an exercise in crisis management. Uh, How has it impacted me? I joke with my team that I now have PTSD and I think (laughs) about cybersecurity every single day. Uh, on on a serious note, I think what what has uh, 
brought to bear for me is an understanding and an appreciation for uh, the fact that we're in a new day and age. And when I go back to the city, what, what I'll say is, um, as odd as this may sound, it was probably one of the best things that happened. If not for that event, I don't think we would have had a successful Super Bowl uh, a few months afterwards. It really put us in a posture so that we were much more proactive. We took care of some of the fundamental issues. And we brought that same perspective to Cox. And uh, we have a great CISO. Uh, He has put in a lot of steps to make sure that everyone understands that cybersecurity is not just a responsibility of technology but it's the responsibility of everyone across the company. So we have great uh, email phishing campaigns, as an example. We've done a really good job of our patch management. And it's something that is top of mind, not just for our CISO, but for everyone. Well, thank you. With that, I want to thank Rick Riaboli, Richard Cox. Thank you both so much for sharing your perspectives and for the great insights you shared. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks for having us.